All right, well, today we're going to talk about bacon. I mean, is there really any better food? I mean, who doesn't love bacon? You can have for breakfast, for bacon and eggs. You can have for lunch with a BLT. You can have for dinner or bacon and uh, cheeseburger. I mean, really, is there really? It's like the pixie dust of food. It makes everything better. Well, unfortunately, it's not that bacon we're talking about today. It's another totally awesome bacon that has done a lot for us. And so today we're going to look at that. Well, let's take a look at exactly what we're going to be talking about other than awesome bacon. We're going to learn about a gentleman named Sir Francis Bacon and his major accomplishment that has totally revolutionized the world and really made it so we are here today and you're in a science class. We're going to identify the steps of the scientific method. Hmm, probably has something to do with uh, Sir Francis Bacon. See the parallels? Uh, we're going to, in particular, we're going to look at those steps, but then we're going to start to focus in on two of them. We're going to look at the first one, observation, and then finally we're also going to look at question. In some later videos, we'll go through the other steps in more detail. So today we're just going to do an overview of it and then those first two. So let's get started. Well, Sir Francis Bacon, as I like to call him since we're close, Frank Bacon, was born in January of 19, uh, I'm sorry, 19, 1561. Right after Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? And a pretty famous guy. He did a lot in his time. He was only a philosopher. He was a statesman and politician, a scientist, a judge. He was a great speaker and author. Uh, he also was the attorney general for all of England. And at the end, his job was Lord Chancellor of England. Now, what he's most known for, though, is a philosopher. And really, he's known as the philosopher of science. He wanted to find a way for us to explore the world and learn things about the world using logic. And in Ray, he said inductive reasoning. And we don't need to get into that, but that's the understanding and really how he formed what is now called the scientific method. Now, unfortunately, he didn't call it that. He liked to name things after himself, and he called it the Baconian method. I kind of wish we still called it that because I would love to teach you guys about bacon. That would just be awesome. Hey, but let's take a look at what his scientific method was. Really, there's five steps. It starts off with observation, looking at the world around you and describing it and measuring it and really lurking at the details. Then he went to a question that based on those observations, you form a question that you want to answer about the world around you. Then after you form this question, you make a prediction. What do you think the answer is going to be? What's the hypothesis? Finally, once you have your prediction, you develop an experiment that's going to test the hypothesis to understand what's happening. Then, once you've done your experiment, you have bunches of data and information. You analyze that data to find the answer to your question. And last, definitely but not least, is observation again based upon your information you just learned, which forms a new question, and the whole thing starts again. Really, the scientific method, it's a loop. Right? Start with observation, you know, question, hypothesis, experiment, and analysis, or analyze, and then all the way back to observation, and we just keep going around and around. Well, what Bacon really did with this scientific method was give us a way to logically and methodically, with the method, understand step by step how the universe works. Right? Well, it's not the only way that we can understand the universe works, but it's the way that science does. If you remember back to our class goals, we said we wanted to develop a scientific way of looking at the world. We do that through the scientific method. But there's lots of other ways, so I don't want you to think that this is the only way you can learn things. It's definitely not. Well, Sir uh, Bacon wasn't without his haters. People didn't just automatically agree with him. In fact, very famously, maybe the greatest scientist ever, a gentleman named Sir Isaac Newton, told everyone uh, that he didn't agree with Bacon. And very famously said, hypothesis non fingo which sounds like a Harry Potter spell, but actually means I don't make hypotheses. I don't make guesses. He said that that whole idea of a scientific method was completely garbage. Well, fortunately for us, Bacon has ended up winning, and we do have a scientific method of sorts. It's kind of changed over time. We don't really follow step by step by step, but they're all there. All the steps are kind of together, um, but they kind of blend. And I think you'll see as we go how they can blend. So let's take a look here at the scientific method, the observation, question, hypothesis, experiment, analysis, observation again. And we're going to break it down. And we're going to look at these first two sections in this video. In the following videos, we'll look at hypothesis and experiment analysis. But in this video, with the very last little bit of it, let's talk about observation and question. Well, our whole scientific method is really built on observation. 
It's using your, our definition for our class. It's going to be using your five senses to describe an object or event, really to gain knowledge. And when you're using observation, this is a case where the devil is in the details. It's all about detail, detail, detail. Right? Observations, they can be uh, describing something. What's its shape? What's its color? Uh, how big is it? By measuring it. Uh, it could be drawing a picture. It could be all sorts of things. But really what you're doing is you're watching and using your five senses to observe something happening. Now, in earth science, rarely do we lick anything. Uh, please don't. But, because sometimes things aren't really healthy for you. But you're using your senses to understand and describe an object or event. Now, what's really important, a lot of times students really get this confused with making a prediction. Right? You see something and you want to say, oh, I know what this is. This is a fossil. Or, oh, this is petrified wood. Ah, something like that. Um, it's not a prediction. That's called an inference or hypothesis. And when you're doing an observation, all you're doing is just describing an object. That being the case, a lot of times I see students like to say, uh, use the word like or as if. And in my class, I like to tell students, when you're doing an observation, there is no valley girls. There is no like as if. Right? You don't use those words. Right? When you're describing something, you're being declarative. You're saying it's brown. It's four inches wide. It's three inches long. Right? You're describing things exactly as you see them. Right? Instead of trying to describe it and, and try to compare it to other objects. That really kind of is a form of a prediction. Right? Now, they can be drawings. Sometimes some of the best science is done through a drawing. Could be a description where you're describing what you see. And they can be a measurement. I hope it goes without saying, though, in my class, an observation always should be a complete sentence. Because you're in middle school now, complete sentences are kind of be expected. So, you've seen something, you observed it, you described it, you understand it. Now you might have some questions. What's happening here? Well, this is where we get to the question part of the scientific method. For our class, for a question, now I know there could be lots of it, but for a science question, it's something a scientist, which are you, wants to know. It's a question to be answered. Now, at school, there's always rules, and there actually is rules for questions in science. There's actually four of them. The first one is that all science questions have to be able to be proven wrong. In science, we call that falsifiability. That a science question can be proven wrong. Because if it can't be proven wrong, then why are we doing it? Right? Give me an example. What if I wanted to study dragons? Dragons are really cool, but you know what? I can't prove right or wrong whether dragons exist. My experiment might show that dragons might not exist now, but could they have existed a long time ago? I have no idea. So, must be able to be proven wrong. A question must also be proven through an experiment. you got to do some sort of test to answer it. Right? Again, I go back to that dragon question. Dragons are cool, but can you come up with an experiment to figure out whether dragons exist? Uh, I can't. I Think about it. I don't know if you can. It has to be based on your observations. We don't just randomly pick questions out to, out to answer. There has to be something that we know and are built upon. And last and least, but not least, it has to be able to be reproduced. Right? It has to be able to be done again by someone else. It can't just be done by you. If you do an experiment and it doesn't work out right, or it does work out right, someone else has to be able to find that exact same thing for it to be a true question. Right? So, we have observation where you're describing the world around you, and then you have question where you're coming up with something you want to know based upon that. Well, let's see. Let's kind of, so that kind of sums up our video. We've done a couple things. I've introduced you to one of the most heroes of science with a great name, Frank Bacon, Sir Francis Bacon, and his contribution to the world to develop the scientific method. We've talked about the individual steps of the scientific method, that first you start out with observation, then you go down to question, then you go to hypothesis, experiment, analyze your data, all the way back to observation, and the whole thing starts again. Uh, then we started to go into understanding observation. And observation is using your five senses to describe the world around you. And then finally, using those senses, you're going to understand and create a question that you're going to test. Right? Well, remember how these videos work? 
If you're missing something or something isn't quite making sense, go ahead and hit pause. You can rewind it, watch it again, go over as many times as you want. But no matter what you're doing, remember, always keep moving forward. See you later.